invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the third chapter. John chapter number three, and we're going to be looking at where a man had a little talk with Jesus. Just a little talk with Jesus. John chapter number three. And let's begin reading verses one through five. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I want you to notice here in verse 1 that this man was named Nicodemus and that he was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a ruling class a religious ruling class in Israel at the time of Christ. Josephus, who was an early historian in the first century who was not a believer, he was a Jewish historian, he was not a believer in the divinity, deity of Christ, he said that about that time there would have been approximately 6,000 Pharisees in Israel. 6,000. And the numbers vary from historian to historian, and maybe as little as 3,000, maybe as many as 10. But Josephus was living at about that time, and he said that there were probably around 6,000 Pharisees. There were two main uh, ruling classes at this time, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees said, we won't believe anything unless we can see it in the Old Testament. We've got to be able to put our finger on it or we'll have no part in it. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels. Uh, They might be considered the more conservative of the two and then the Sadducees would die out about the time the, the temple was destroyed and the Pharisees would last for many more years. But Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a man who had authority and he had power. He had status in life. The Bible says that not only was he a Pharisee, but he was a ruler of the Jews. He was a teacher. So this man had some prominence. He had some influence. But he did not have salvation. He was deeply religious And all of the things that many would consider important in that day and even to this day, he had that. But he did not have faith in Christ. He did not have salvation and forgiveness of sin. And because of that, you had a man here who was deeply religious and very respected, but he was hell-bound. As I've read through Scripture... I'll go ahead and give you the good news. As I have read through Scripture, as far as during the ministry of Christ, during the earthly ministry of Christ, I only see one Pharisee coming to faith. Only one. Matter of fact, Jesus had some very stern words for the Pharisees. He often would speak harshly to them. And He would always tell them the truth. He would not water it down. He would not hold back. He would tell the truth to these Pharisees. But in all of their debates, in all the times that they would confront Christ and try to catch Christ, in all of that interaction, we only see one, as far as recorded biblical history, of a Pharisee coming to faith, and that was Nicodemus. And there was great growth 
spiritual growth within Nicodemus. As we read through this passage, even in the few verses that we've read, the words of Jesus went over his head. It reminds me of when I was in algebra class as a freshman. Uh, it went over my head. This conversation, this little talk that Nicodemus was having with Christ was going over his head, but eventually it would find root in his heart and he would confess Christ as Savior. How do I know that? Well, if you were to flip towards the end of the Gospel of John, you will find that when our Lord was crucified, and when he cried out from the cross with those famous seven statements, when he would cry out, it is finished, and into thy hands I commit my spirit, there were two men who come out in daylight and said, we want the body of Christ. One was Joseph of Arimathea. He had been a secret disciple of the Lord, and our Lord's body was very lovingly prepared by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus for burial. And they placed the body of Christ in Joseph of Arimathea's own tomb. The Bible said that he would be buried in a rich man's tomb and it was fulfilled. But Joseph approached Pilate and said, please let me have my Lord's body. And he did something that was really uncommon. He permitted it. Many times crucifixion victims' bodies would be thrown into the dump. It would be thrown to the outskirts of the city. But he granted Joseph of, Joseph of Arimathea's request. And then Nicodemus assisted in taking down his body very lovingly and carefully from that cross. And then prepared his body in haste for burial. And had the stone rolled across the tomb. Now Nicodemus, you'll find here, approaches Jesus under the cover of darkness. Under the cover of darkness. And darkness really was a symbol of where he was. It's a symbol of where I was at one time. Darkness uh, could, it would be a symbol of sin. It would be a symbol of ignorance. And that's where Nicodemus was, even though he was a ruler, a Pharisee, a teacher of men. He comes to Jesus by night and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God and no man can do the miracles that you're doing except God be with him. We have seen some miracles that our Lord has performed recorded in John and John also said that the world itself could not hold all the books that could be written about what our Lord did, if they were all to be written. We only have a snapshot of what our Lord did while He was on this earth. He did much more than is recorded. But I think you and I can only grasp so much. And it may be that when we get to glory, we're going to find out throughout all of eternity what our Lord did during those three years. We only see some of that now. And Jesus said to him, as he was having this conversation with this man, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man is born again, born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Christ cut to the chase. He knew what was on this man's mind. A Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, prominent, successful, influential, but there was something missing in his life, and I believe he sensed it. He sensed it. He knew that everything was not right. And he came to Christ. I can remember in my life when the light went on, so to speak. After being under the sound of God's word for a number of weeks, and I sensed things were not right in me, with me. The reason I went to church is because I th thought things were not right with my family, which was a true statement. But that's why I started going to church. There was something wrong with my family. But when I got under the gospel, I discovered there was something wrong with me. And I really needed to get my eyes off of everyone else and focus on me. 
And we would call that Holy Spirit conviction that I was able to receive because I got under the sound of God's Word. Well, Nicodemus has sensed something is not quite right, so he goes to have a little talk with Jesus, and Christ cuts to the chase and says to him, Nicodemus, you must be born again. That sounds like a necessity, doesn't it? Jesus emphasized the necessity of salvation to this man. You need to be born from above. Very quickly, Nicodemus is having trouble grasping this concept, just like I did the first time I heard it. I heard a pastor talking about, you need to be saved. And in my mind, I remember this, saved from what? Saved from what? I was so biblically ignorant, I had no earthly idea what salvation meant. I had no idea why Christ died. None of this had been taught to me, and it was all brand new stuff. Yet I was in rural South Georgia, born and raised in the buckle of the Bible belt, and I was completely ignorant of God's Word. Knew nothing whatsoever. I can relate to Nicodemus, even though he would know more Bible than I did because he knew much of the Old Testament, whether or not he grasped the truths. So Christ said, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born from above. So he very quickly in verse 4 says, how can I be born again? How can someone who is old enter into his mother's womb the second time and be born Christ was speaking of the spiritual, and he was focusing on the physical. Verse number 5, And Jesus answered, this is real important, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I assure you, Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what does it mean to be born of water? Well, I'll tell you what it does not mean. It does not mean that water baptism is a necessity for salvation. How do I know that? Well, I know that by comparing Scripture with Scripture. For instance, in a few weeks in Sunday school, we're going to be in Acts 16 looking at the Philippian jailer when Paul and Silas were thrown in prison and a great earthquake takes place, and all everyone's bands are loosed, and the doors flies open, but no one escapes. And prior to all of that happening, Paul and Silas, who had been beaten up for helping a lady escape demonic bondage, they had set her free. Paul and Silas, after they had been beaten up and put in bands, decided to have a song service. They decided to have a prayer meeting. And I don't know how long this went on, but it started long about midnight. Long about midnight, they broke out in song in praise to our God, and they had a prayer service. And I believe that old jailer who was lying on his cot was listening to every word of it, saying, I wish they would quit. And then the foundations began to shake. And he jumped up and he called for a light because he just knew that that prison was probably empty. And he drew his dagger and was prepared to take his own life because he knew what his authorities, his principles would do to him if anyone had escaped. And Paul cried out, don't hurt yourself. We are all here. And then he took that light and he said, I can't believe it. They all are here. And here's what he did. He went to Paul and Silas and fell down on his knees and he asked them one question. What must I do to be saved? He didn't ask them, why did the floor shake? Why did no one run? Why did the, the, everyone's... Ba he didn't ask that. He said, what must I do to be saved? Here's Paul's answer. It's found in Acts 16 and 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, had water baptism been essential for salvation, Paul would have included that. He didn't include it. 
He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you've got your Bibles open, if you'll just look there at John 3.16, many of you can quote it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him and gets baptized, it's not what it says, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17, I want to read this one to you. This is a powerful verse. I probably can't quote that one close enough to do it justice. But 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 17, Paul, speaking about his own ministry, said this, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Wouldn't it be ironic that if baptism was essential for salvation, that God would send a man to do half the job? Paul said, the Lord didn't send me here to baptize. He sent me here to preach the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves. And then I'm reminded in Luke 23 about the thief on the cross. You remember on that day when our Lord was crucified, there were two thieves that were crucified as well. Christ was in the middle and a thief on either side. When all of this agony began to unfold, the two thieves initially lashed out at Jesus. They're mad at the people who are crucifying him, them, they're mad at the innocent one that's being crucified along with them. They are mad at the world. So they're lashing out at anybody and everybody, and particularly Christ. But over the course of that gruesome crucifixion experience, one of those thieves come under Holy Ghost conviction and realized that he was staring eternity in the face and he was about to cross over and it was going to be soon. And he realized that this one that was by him was truly the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And here's what he did. That thief prayed a prayer. And sometimes people are afraid of praying a public prayer. I remember the first time I had a public prayer in a church service. I was about 16, 17 years old. My pastor just called on me. He didn't give me any warning. And there wasn't anybody else in the church that had the same first name, so I couldn't look over there and say, it was me. And I was scared. And I got through it. It caught me off guard. He didn't give me any advance warning. But sometimes we're a little fearful initially to pray publicly. But prayer is just talking to your Heavenly Father. And this thief, when he was on the cross... I don't think he had to be nudged too hard to pray. And he decided to pray. And you remember what he prayed? One sentence. He prayed one sentence. And you know what the answer was? Here's the prayer. He said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now Jesus did not cry out from the cross, and I don't mean this irreverently, He didn't cry out from the cross, can you take Him down and baptize Him? He didn't say to Him, uh, Son, I heard your prayer, but sorry, uh, you're not going to be able to be baptized. There's nothing I can do for you. No. He prayed a one-sentence prayer, and the Lord said, Today you will be with me in paradise. Again, no water baptism. Now, don't go out of here and say, Well, that preacher doesn't believe in water baptism. I do. But I believe it's something you do after you've been saved. I believe you do that afterwards in obedience to identify yourself with Christ, to show outwardly what has already taken place inwardly. But I do stand on Scripture that baptism is not essential in order to be saved. 
So if that's not, if that's what water, what the uh, being born of water is not, what is what is being born of water? Well, I think if you look at verse four, Nicodemus is talking about childbirth, natural childbirth. Many of you in here are mothers. You have. You've given birth and you know all about that process and all about that experience. And you've heard the expression, uh, well, her water broke. And those of you that are more scientific and medically inclined than I am, you know that the, uh, the little baby is carried inside uh, the mother's womb in, in liquid he was talk, Nicodemus was talking about a physical birth, and Christ said, well, yes, you've got to be born of water, you've got to be naturally born, but you also have to be born of the Spirit. For he goes on to say in verse 6, that which is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. A physical birth is not sufficient. From time to time, I hear of people say, well, we're all God's children. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're all God's creation. There's nothing that exists that would exist without God. But you're telling me that Idi Amin was a child of God. Adolf Hitler was a child of God. Joseph Stalin was a child of God. Serial killers that we have had arrested and put in prison, they're children of God? No, they're not children of God. They're children of Satan. But we're all a part of creation. To be a child of God, you have to be born from above. You have to have a spiritual birth. Here's what John said about that in John chapter 1, uh, verses 12 and 13. Listen to this. We've already looked at these a few weeks ago. But John 1, 12 and 13, But as many as received Him, Christ, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were not born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The new birth is a God thing. Being born again, being born from above is a God thing. Now some of you wonderful planners maybe sat down with your spouse and said, how many children do we want to have and when do we want to have them? And you were able to, to plan them. I've, I've, I had a dear friend years ago told us when we were young, many, many years ago when we were young, have a child every three years. That was her advice, and that's what she did. I mean, she nailed it. Uh, I've got another friend who had three children. All three were born in the same month, and they were not triplets. Uh, that's the way some people do it. And then there's other people who named their first child or second child. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh-oh, that was what we were thinking about naming our first one. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, we planned some of them, and then some of them uh, just kind of happened, you know. But at least we as couples, we think about it. We hope to, and we think that this would be a good year, or perhaps this month or that month would be a good month. But when it comes to being born from above, it's not in your plans. It's not in your power. It is a God thing where you and I hear the Word of God and the Spirit of God takes that Word and draws us to the Son of God. Now, it's important to be under the sound of the Word. Dear people, bring your family to church. Get them to Sunday school. Let them have an extra hour under the ministry of the Word. Do all that you can do so that they are exposed to the Word of God and especially while their hearts are tender because they are being inundated by other kinds of messages. They're being inundated and pulled in all kinds of directions and these messages and these directions are not going to be what we want them to accept and to adopt and embrace. 
Get your children and your grandchildren under the Word of God. Get yourself under the ministry of the Word of God. He says in verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Look what Jesus is doing. He is speaking of the necessity of salvation over and over with this little talk that is taking place with Nicodemus. You must be born again. You and I have a lot of decisions in life that we make that are optional. They're optional. A lot of them aren't all that critical, right? Will the car be blue or will it be red? Will the interior be black or will it be gray? It just doesn't matter. Will it be pizza or will it be fried chicken? A lot of our decisions you and I have and options, they're not critical. One is as good as another. They're nothing more than mere preferences. But when it comes to salvation, Christ says, you must. You must be born from above. You must be born again if you want to have eternal life and to be able to live in the presence of God and miss eternal damnation. We're winding down now very quickly. We're going to verse 15, verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but you cannot tell whence it comes and whither it goes. And so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Many times... Well, for that matter, uh, in Greek and Hebrew alike, the word that represents the Holy Spirit is a word that represents wind. And just as you and I can't see the wind, we can't see the Holy Spirit. We can see the effects of the wind, and it's always good to see the effects of the Holy Spirit. I believe when a person truly gets born again, they're going to be a different person. They're going to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. And they're going to be, the Bible says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we're going, to, we're going to walk to a different tune. We're going to have different values and different priorities in life. Verse 10, Jesus answered. Well, verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus said unto him, Are you a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Jesus says, You're a teacher, and you don't understand this? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? things. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That reference in verse 14 is a remarkable story. It's found in the book of Numbers, the 21st chapter. Start reading around verse 4 to verse 9. But in Numbers 21, the people of Israel were doing something that God's people are really good at. They were grumbling. They were complaining and murmuring. They were complaining against God and they were complaining against Moses. They were hungry and they were thirsty and they were tired and they were tired of walking around in the woods and they were fed up with Moses and they didn't think God was giving them a fair shake. And God said, okay, it's time for a lesson. And here was the lesson. God turned loose venomous snakes. He turned them loose, and I'm talking about in large numbers, and they began to bite these murmuring, complaining people who were angry with God and angry with His representative Moses, and people began to die. Now, most of us would freak out if we were to see a snake slithering under the pew this morning. Some of y'all would start walking on the pews. And there was one up here in the pulpit. You'd see me floating a little bit as well. But poisonous snakes in large numbers and they were biting people and people were dying. 
And the people said to Moses, intercede for us. We've messed up and we know it. Talk to God for us. And Moses prayed and God said, Moses, here's what you do. I want you to construct a brass snake. And I want you to put him on a pole and I want you to hold that pole up. And I want you to tell the people that if they will look to that brass snake, in faith they will be healed. So as people were being stricken, they looked up and said, I'm going to take God at His word, and they were healed. They didn't die. Now, if some of them said, well, let's see if we can make a serum real quick, an antidote, they would have fallen over dead. If somebody would have done like my granny used to do, pass out the hose and let's get to chopping snakes, they would have died. My granny was from northeast Mississippi. I mean, she could kill a rattlesnake with a short hoe handle. I never was that brave, but she had whop them good. She was a country lady. She knew how to beat up on those snakes. But if they'd have done any of that, they would have perished. Moses said, God said, the only thing you can do to live is to look to this brazen snake in faith. Jesus said in verse number 14, that as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, look at it, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That means that Jesus said, I must go to a cross. I must be crucified and die in your place. And that if you will look to the cross, you can be saved. If you will look to Jesus, that poison of unbelief will no longer have power over you. If you will look to Jesus, you will not have to experience forever spiritual death. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 15, Whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This morning, and I'm closing right here. I'm closing the Bible. Now you know I haven't got but ten more minutes. Now, I'm closing my Bible. Do you know that you know that you've been born again? As I've said many times from this pulpit, when I first started attending church, I thought I was going to heaven. I'd always thought that because I thought good people went to heaven and I had definitely labeled myself good. And then I found out the Bible says there's none good. <clears throat> no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I found out that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. So I had my world rocked when I started attending a little country church in South Georgia. I had my world rocked. It was turned upside down. I heard things that made me uncomfortable. I heard things that when I went home at night, I thought about them when I was lying in bed as a teenager, thinking, surely that can't be right. Surely God's going to let me go to heaven. And I could not get saved until I quit arguing with God. I can remember sitting in a pew like this and I would say to myself well I haven't done what he has done I'd think about some of my classmates and I'd always pick out the, the real knotheads I wouldn't pick out the quiet kind people I'd always pick out the naughtiest of the knotheads to try to make myself feel better and I would say well he goes to church and if he's going to heaven surely I am and until I stopped that I couldn't get saved and then finally I realized Lord I'm a sinner I'm going to hell and you're my only hope. That is when I could be born again. Have you reached that place? If you've never been saved, I want, to, I want to ask you to do something for God and for yourself. Walk the aisle during the invitation and say, Brother Jay, pray with me. I want to be saved today. Walk the aisle and say to God and to yourself, I need salvation. Brother Jay, pray with me. I want to be saved today. Miss Trudy, you come. Let's bow our heads together in prayer and then we're going to stand and sing. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time we've had together. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the little talk that Nicodemus had with Jesus. A little talk that we were privileged to listen in on. 
and to hear the conversation. And Lord, that conversation applies to us. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Lord, I pray for these wonderful people, good people, people that we love and want, would have as a neighbor, but we want them saved as well. We want to see them in glory. Speak to their hearts. Help them to be obedient to you. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.